So very good. Uh, after lunch, always a difficult time. I'm going to present you um, work in progress on banks and sanctions. Uh, and uh, to this extent, uh, it's a bit like you're sitting in a restaurant, you see the, the cooks behind the window uh, sweat. Um, so I'll have some of that sweat in the presentation. It's going to be a bit bumpy, a uh, 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 construction site, uh, but bear with me. So um, this is uh, going to be on uh, banks being affected by shocks outside of the sector. Of course, we have st financial stability issues that are maybe cooked up by uh, plumbing, configuration of banking sector, uh, but there's also outside uh, disasters, if you want. This is, by the way, from a, a report we're working on for a think tank in Italy, um, where basically banks are being affected by the uh, fallout from armed conflicts, infectious diseases, pandemics, epidemics, and natural disasters. And so there's, there's sort of research on this in all these areas. I'm going to focus today on uh, armed conflicts and more in particular on financial sanctions, which are um, emanating uh, from these uh, armed conflicts. Now, um, conflicts have increased despite the sort of uh, pinker hypothesis of, of the slide in violence over many centuries. There may be an uptick now, and if you look at this heat map for 2000, and then you look at 2022, there's, there's maybe issues there in terms of an uptick in, in, in conflicts. Um, and um, the, this are actually, sl slides are missing here. I also had a heat map on the sanctions. Okay, there, there we go, seems, uh, or they're slightly different. Uh, so the number of sanctions actually are also uh, increasing. Um, and that is uh, for sure the case. You look 2000, 2010, 2020, 2021. Now, the type of sanctions, uh, let me see if I go back. Sorry about that small misallocation. So then the type of sanctions are going to be by um, individuals, corporations, countries, multilateral organizations, or uh, on individuals, corporations, and countries, we're going to be uh, interested in the, the, the red box there, countries on corporations, and we're going to be interested in, in financial sanctions. There are many other types of sanctions as well that are uh, categorized there, as you see. Sports, diplomatic, travel, economic, and the types of trade sanctions. Okay, so then, now, what do financial sanctions do to banks, and, and would they be any different to uh, sanctions on other agents? Well, you know, very um, uh, superficially speaking, we could say, well, maybe they could uh, affect banks differently. Why? Because banks are opaque, so are able to hide, they're difficult for regulators to know what to optimally do. Uh, clearly, investors uh, also have issues. So. The opacity of banks clearly plays a role in how financial sanctions may or may not uh, bite uh, on banks. Banks are also nimble, so to use a loaded word, they may be able to arbitrage easily, more easily the sanctions than other, uh, other economic agents. And we also think, I mean, this Columbus Harbor, others have argued, provi provided evidence that banks are politically connected. So they may actually be able to block or at least influence the writing and enforcement of these uh, sanctions in many countries. So that's why it may be interesting to look specifically at how financial sanctions may affect bank activity. And we could think that clearly financial sanctions may sort of, if you want, deglobalize bank activity. That could be one hypothesis, making banks act more regional, not to be affected by these sanctions. At the same time, also the level of governance itself may uh, deglobalize and therefore then end up uh, more regional. Now, what I'm going to focus on, and, and now I'm going to into the weeds, is a specific paper where we look at how financial uh, sanctions are going to affect Russian banks. And call it crime and punishment, uh, and the uh, papers very much work with Michael and Anna, who, who are now at the Toulouse Business School. It's actually part of a small research agenda I have with them, given that they were in pol policy-making uh, circles in, in Moscow for almost a decade, uh, and, and they're now into academia. They, they do bring to the table some um, knowledge on the issue and how these sanctions may affect banks. I'm going to do my best to channel uh, that knowledge to you. There is, um, th these are some of the citations also for the future reference for you because the slides will be made available afterwards as far as I understand on the conference site. Now, in 2014, 
and not dissimilar from the talking that we had on the sanctions today, or, or recently last year, was that this is going to really hit very hard. So the Economist in 2014 was saying this is going to hurt, uh, while in 2022 was sort of recognizing that, well, maybe these sanctions do not affect these agents in, in Russia that much. So there is clearly always high expectations, high talk, and then in effect maybe uh, not in all domains of, of sanctioneering, these sanctions are going to be equally effective. So here we're going to focus on the financial sanctions of the West on Russia, where the crime is the Crimea's annexation and, and more, obviously, uh, Syria, also U.S. elections. And then the punishment was the full or partial ban on, on international operations of some of these Russian banks. Now, this is important. Corporate external debt is 30 percent of GDP at, in 2013. And we're going to have basically two elements that are going to play a role also, if you want, in our uh, operational unfolding of our uh, research here is one that only the state-connected banks are going to be targeted. And we're going to have staggered policy implementation, which uh, from an ec econometric point of view is sort of interesting and, and, and currently part of a developing applied econometrics literature. So we're going to, uh, we're going to have three, so if you want, cool ingredients in this paper. One is that not yet sanctioned banks, um, we're going to ask ourselves the question, are they going to in advance adapt their international operation? This fits into the nimbleness of, of, the, of the bank characteristics that I mentioned before. Is it the case, in, and then the second one, in terms of treatment diffusion, is it the case that private banks, so those that are not in, in the, um, that are not locked uh, with these uh, sanctions, could they also fear to be affected? And are they going to adjust their operations? Uh, and so are private banks with political connections, we're going to spend a lot of time actually manufacturing a uh, political connection map of the, all of these financial institutions in, in Russia? Are they going to be affected too? And then the, what are the real effects? So how are these sanctions then transmitted uh, to the banks, to the borrowing firms, and also to some extent to, to, to households borrowing? So these, these are the, the main elements. These are the shocks. These are the sanctions that we're going to look at. 2014, the last one, 2019. So there are going to be 12 announcements. Uh, and this is by the um, OFAC. They hit 44 state-connected banks. And we're going to call these sanctions uh, debt sanctions and asset sanctions. They're not the official names. Here you see the sectoral sanctions, identifications, or specially designed national. So there, we're going to call them debt and asset sanction because that's actually more representative of what part of the balance sheet these uh, sanctions are going to hit. And notice that we're going to have quite a bit of uh, play here in the sense that 75% uh, of the total credit to non-financial firms is going to be indirectly affected by, by these sanctions in the end, right? Uh, 67 households and then 50% of the, of the total assets. So these are, this is a nice series of sanctions to look at, to study. This is what we try to do. So then we're going to have basically uh, a lot of op operational details here, but it, it's just to show that it, it's not that clear and, and, uh, and obvious how, how you would go about establishing uh, an assessment of the impact of such san sanctions. Because clearly, you, one has to uh, compare uh, um, uh, apples with apples. And so you want to match sanctioned banks and never sanctioned banks. We do that. We have then an event study. We're going to modify difference and difference. Again, these are all sort of operational details. We're going to feed that into uh, an, an SVAR. This is, this is just to say that we work very hard on this. Um, then we're going to basically connect. We're going to see who's on the board of all these banks. This took us a year, actually, to pull together from a variety of databases, some which are no longer in, in the public domain. Um, and then we're going to see basically what is the risk based on these political connections that these banks could be affected and then see what they actually do, right? So, so how do they assess this risk and, and what do they then actually do? And then the real effects. So we're going to then look at uh, syndicated loans, um, and then uh, look at also firm performance. Okay, so then what do we find? So these are then basically the five takeaways. So we're going to have, to some extent, the effects are, are 
t going in, in, in different directions. And, and the heterogeneity here was already mentioned is, 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 is not without consequences. And so some of the effects are intended. We're going to have contraction of the, of, of the banks, of the balance sheets that are targeted, but others are actually unintended in the sense that uh, for the debt sanctions, for example, banks are going to start issuing more debt, um, foreign debt. So to this extent, some of these effects are clearly unintended. And um, the first sanction announcement is going to be uh, the strongest one. And there's going to be a lot of anticipation effects. So sanction writers should potentially uh, take this into consideration. Added effect of later sanctions announcements are actually fairly limited. Uh, I'm going to show you that somewhat. And then there's going to be credit reallocation. So it is the case that firms uh, did s witness a contraction of the credit that they received, while households actually um, um, saw an increase in, in the credit that they were receiving. And so to this extent, government uh, policy and support actually is going to matter here. So there, there was a clearly uh, a steer, steering of credit towards then households to the, to, the, to the extent that this was possible. So these would be the three takeaways in terms of the overall effect of, of the sanctions. Then we bring in our measure of political connections. So then we have basically, we see who's, who's on the boards of these banks and, and, and where else do these uh, people operate uh, at the different levels of government. And, and then we see that actually the more uh, intense the political connections, the more severe the anticipation effects. So those that are actually going to be private banks that are not uh, uh, in principle, in the bullseyes of, of these sanctions, we're going to see those private banks also start uh, reflecting on, oh, hey, this could actually affect me as well. And then we see them also anticipating, we see them changing their balance sheet accordingly. And this is going, that effect is going to be uh, more significant if we have more political connections. Um, and, but still, the effect is lower. They're going to say, uh, react to say 50% of the uh, 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 to a tune of 50% of what we saw for those banks that were really affected, especially initially, uh, and also then with the anticipation effects. So then the real effects of sanctions, um, we will see that not yet sanctioned banks are going to reduce the loan supply by about 20%, and especially the sanctioned sanctioned. Uh, combination, so sanctioned bank with sanctioned firm, because actually concurrently there were also effects uh, for firms. There we see clearly a hit. However, for those firms that were sanctioned and were doing business with unsanctioned bank, there they can actually modulate. They can mitigate the impact, again, what you would expect. Um, they actually start investing more. Uh, and, and despite the fact that they take a bit of hit on, on immediate revenues, they, they feel a bit upbeat about the fact that they are having the ability to get this credit from this unsanctioned bank. Okay, so then in terms of indented contributions, uh, clearly um, th these are uh, in, in passing by. So let me then explain a little bit the nuts and bolts in the time remaining and then give a few uh, thoughts afterwards. So this is basically the mechanics of these financial sanctions. So we're going to have what we call debt sanctions. So basically, uh, foreign debt is, is now uh, being sanctions, restricted. Uh, or we're going to what we call foreign asset sanctions. They're going to affect uh, also the asset side, the holdings uh, of, of the banks. So now these debt sanctions are going to hit 20 banks. Um, there are going to be four of them state-owned, and you can read them there. This is state-owned development bank, and then 15 major subsidiaries of these uh, big four. Um, now the uh, asset sanctions are going to hit 24. They're going to be banks operating in, in Crimea, uh, and there's going to be also four banks controlled by these oligarchs, and then uh, 10 other banks controlled by local governments on state-owned entities. So you see some variation there for an empiricist that's always good to have. Uh, that there, there are different banks that, it, that are going to be affected. Now, in terms of data, what do we uh, mobilize here? We're going to have bank level data. Uh, this is um, also coming from the Central Bank of Russia. Um, 
Then we're going to have the political connections, which we collected ourselves based on the bank's annual reports, uh, structure of the board of directors, and then the person's CV, which we're going to call from a variety of public sor sources. And then we do Google searches and, and, and do our best to piece together uh, these um, political connections. Then we're going to also look at syndicated loan level data. Uh, clearly, there's going to be fewer of those than in, in many studies that you will see with syndicated loan level data because we require that the Russian bank is going to be present and then we're going to have firm level data. So all of this together is what the study is going to be about. So um, now, what we're going to do is basically we're going to and this is an important point. So this is basically the first bank on the sanction is going to be the, the, the red line here. And you can see that this is going to be um, going to have an effect on the foreign assets and, and, and to a lesser extent on the foreign liabilities of, of this firm. Now, this bank here uh, is going to be hit much later. But you can see here also uh, its foreign liabilities and its foreign assets is going, is going to respond already to the first announcement. So when Rossiya was being hit. Okay, so this is basically, this is just now a visual representation what we're going to tie up in, in empirical analysis. And without, you know, uh, too many slides I have, we're going to try to tease this out. What's the impact of the first? What's the impact of, of the later? And this is what the specification I just showed you about. So we're going to have these treatment group that are going to be hit by debt sanctions or asset sanctions. And then we're going to have this control group, which are going to be never sanctioned bank and also bank actually that do not have any political connections. Okay. Then we have, you know, the, the, the matching, all the work that goes into this, all the trade-offs involved. And of course, we're going to do this matching prior to the, to the whole spiel unfolding. So then uh, what we're going to see is that you know, once we do the matching, we're sort of there. With the ex no, there's no stars in the last column, so the difference between the never sanctioned and, and sanctioned bank looks sort of okay, with except for the assets, which is almost unavoidable, given that these big four were among those that are going to be affected. So this is uh, anticipation of treatment then by not not yet sanctioned bank, and this is in terms of foreign foreign borrowings, and this is I think. Interesting in the sense that what we see is that those are, that are not being affected yet by these sanctions, they're actually going to start borrowing more. And, but they're not going to do that with, with asset sanctions. So when you have debt sanctions, clearly as a bank, if you think the debt sanctions are going to affect you later on, you may as well borrow a little more because to some extent the risk is not on you. The risk is on, on those that are, are holding your securities that, that are going to be abroad, okay? So this is one takeaway uh, in terms of the unexpected, unintended consequence of uh, debt sanctions is that actually banks that are not yet affected by these sanctions, they may actually just try to uh, get the best out of a bad situation and, and, and jump. To the extent that they can find uh, buyers for their securities, they, they will do so. This is not the case for asset sanctions, because clearly there, if, you hold, if, you ha if you're holding stock abroad and then they're subject to sanctions, you will, will, will suffer potentially as a bank. You're in a much weaker position. And say so we do the, some exercise on Euro banks to tie this up and then we have our tables with all the specifications and, and you see then also for foreign asset holdings, uh, uh, this is also the case. Uh, again, I took, I took away, uh, I took with me too many slices just to show you that the, the cooks are working, so to speak, and, and, and sweating themselves through the, what we're working on here. So in terms of takeaway here, after the first sanction announcement, so the first sanction announcement opened a series of announcements, but the effect is there. So, so the, the not yet debt sanctioned banks are going to increase and not reduce their foreign borrowings but they're going to decrease their foreign assets. Not yet asset sanctioned banks are going to reduce both. They're going to reduce both their foreign borrowings. They're going to shrink their balance sheet basically. Okay, so now, what I did not show you was that there's actually also heterogeneity in this effect across space and, and oil extraction. So if you're close to Moscow, this effect is actually going to be larger on both accounts. So you're going to have more intense uh, anticipation by banks that are closer to Moscow or that are actually uh, in, in oil extraction uh, areas.
So now, what is the added value of further sanctions? Okay, so once you now have your first sanction done, you can see then basically you're going to have the early treated group in black. Now you see the, the path of the later treated group. Now the anticipation is taking its effect. And now at this juncture, you're going to have the second sanction and now you're going to be treated. Now the question is a little bit, are you going to then continue on that path? Where was your anticipation correct? Or are you going to start correcting yourself and saying, oops, it's actually better than we anticipated, or are you going to say, well, it's actually worse than anticipated, which is the green line here. So this is then the investigation that we do in this, in this second part uh, of the analysis. So we want to see basically how anticipation to some extent was correct and, and, and what then banks did as a consequence. And again, these are the tables, we're working hard. This is basically what we find is that, ba that, that in terms of the debts of the foreign borrowings, we, we're able to only offset the effect of the first announcement. So to this extent, the foreign borrowings, remember, increased, and now they're going to offset that. So you're back to, to almost like baseline. Okay. Now, in terms of the asset sanctions, there you have a partial rebound in terms of asset repurchases. Okay. So to this extent, um, so there was a bit of an overselling them before uh, or evading of sanctions afterwards. You, you figure out how to do this, uh, and this is then consistent with the sanction evasion by German banks as documented in the Effing et al. paper. So to this extent, you see this advanced adaptation and then play out in, in further treatment uh, as, as being um, important. Now, what then about credit re reallocation? So here we have an analysis then on uh, other aspects of the bank's balance sheet. And so what we then see is how private uh, deposits, uh, depending on the type of sanction, debt sanction and asset sanction, are going to uh, um, be affected or, or act. Uh, and you can see that indeed the individual effect is basically the, the, when the treatment hits, when, the, when they, the bank gets affected by the sanction, the informational effect is when the first sanction is going to hit and, and they are potentially now in, in the bullseye of the sanctions later on. And you can see that the effect is going to be mainly, at least for the deposits, for the debt sanctions, uh, at least only when there actually is the hit of the bank. Um, while here, for the, for the asset sanctions, it hits uh, also in, in the, uh, <coughs> when the first sanction hit, but actually the depositors are going to increase their uh, holdings at that bank. So to this extent, uh, again, somewhat uh, unexpected uh, in, in this regard. Then also the loans, credit to uh, non-financial firms, you, you can do these uh, assessments of what the informational and individual effect is, always the, uh, when the first sanction hit and then the individual effect. Um, of course, here we take out the Rosia, the first bank, uh, when we do the assessment of the informational effect and then also for the household. So now the takeaway here is basically that the private, uh, that the depositors, there was no run. So, so those that were hoping that these financial sanctions were somehow going to be effective enough to some, somehow bring, bring down or partially bring down the banking uh, sector in Russia because by triggering some sort of a depositor run, which was not you know, totally uh, impossible, they were at least, at least there's no runs in advance. However, once the bank gets hit, there is some, some uh, effect of depositors withdrawing their money uh, potentially to home. Now, we then also have assessments of what the government is doing. Uh, the government steps in actually uh, quite well, if I may, cleverly, in terms of um, making sure that the funds are there in advance for these banks. And there is some sort of a re credit reshuffling. So non-financial firms are getting less credit and households are now getting more credit. Um, and so to this extent, this is going to matter then potentially also for the, the, the outcomes. So this is in terms of the effects. Now, what about the private banks? So those that are not treated, never. Uh, of course, you could say, well, in anticipation, that was not so clear, fair, fair comment. So that, that is also why some of the exercise that we did before where we, we had this anticipation effect. So here, we're going to see 
how uh, we're going to capture these political connections from uh, these uh, board compositions uh, of, the, of the banks. Uh, and we're going to see the matching on the different levels of, of, of government. And so then we say, okay, this bank has uh, political connections. And then we calculate uh, some, some sort of very coarse measure of these political connections, and then we're going to see whether or not this is going to predict uh, whether or not they're going to be uh, sanctioned. Okay, and so then we have a prediction model where you can see the outputs from, you can actually predict fairly well on the basis of, um, I mean, you, you, you can, no, I stand correct, you can see that the effect that the prediction of, of actually being affected uh, is, is actually not, not trivial uh, and, and could indeed um, uh, play a role. So then we are going to have basically, again, uh, all sorts of footwork to establish the following takeaways. So these private banks with political connections, they never face sanctions, but despite the fact that they're never going to be face, facing these sanctions, of course, this is exposed. So what we're going to see is that we're going to have some anticipation of debt sanctions, uh, and um, they were raising their foreign borrowing. So these private banks with these political connections thought, well, this is actually a good time, given that our political connections in self-reflection, we may be hit by sanctions. We may as well now go to the market and, and, and raise our foreign borrowings after these first sanction announcements. Now, we have another 13 that were potentially anticipated asset, asset sanctions, and they were selling these foreign assets in advice. So um, these diffusion effects are smaller than the baseline effects, but they're still significant, okay? Um, now then, what, is, what about then the uh, effects on the firms? So here we do uh, exercise with syndicated loan data. We say, is there a reduction of loan supply to corporate borrowers? And so how does it affect the borrower's performance? And if you look through these tables, um, you will see that basically there is going to be an effect. So not yet sanctioned banks are going to reduce their loan supply. So they are working on their balance sheet and they are going to reduce their loan supply. We can do with, with syndicated loans, take some steps towards identify, uh, identifying that this is coming from the supply side after the first announcement. Again, it's that first announcement that really does the trick here. Um, and there's a non-trivial -tri transmission to the balance sheets of the firm. So this is then with balance sheet information from the firms, we est establish that especially the sanctioned bank, sanctioned firm combination is quite detrimental for the firm. So we're going to have employment, investment, and revenues decreasing. The unsanctioned bank, sanctioned firm combination is somewhat better, presumably because the, the sanctioned firm can then draw upon this unsanctioned bank uh, who, who is willing to provide the, the credit. So very tentative conclusions. So clearly, we have here a staggered implementation of a reform, I'm calling it, of a sanction. So, but in advance, adaptation may matter a great deal. And to some extent, from policymakers' perspective, this, this is not, uh, not without any value maybe to know. So to this extent, not, that, not yet debt sanctioned banks were actually raising their foreign debts. They're trying to get into the door. And actually, on the other side, they find investors uh, willing to, to, to buy these, these securities. The banks themselves couldn't care less, because to some extent, they get, they get the money. Um, now, the not yet asset sanctioned banks, they're actually overselling their foreign assets. So they're, they're very afraid of their, their assets abroad getting stuck in, in, in a sanction regime. Now, and the geographical location of banks and oil extraction affect in advance adaptation. So there's heterogeneous effect also when it comes to adaptation. Staggered implementation, so th there's a limited value. I think we can conclude this on the basis of our work, that uh, our ongoing work, that there's further policy announcements have lim limited effects. So rolling this out uh, um, may, may not help you much further. You may as well front load it. And there's a credit res reshuffling, which is you know, p potentially useful to shield the, uh, the economy from the effects. Now, for those that are not in the, uh, in the bullseye, of course, this is exposed. They don't know this ex ante. Also, they are going to start reshuffling. So these private banks with, un, uh, with political connections uh, are also going to adapt their um, um, 
balance sheet, and then the, the combination of the two, sanctioning banks and firms, that's going to hit hard. Um, now, two extras based on, on two other papers, one also with Michael, uh, and also two authors from the Central Bank of Russia, uh, Svetlana and Natalia, so the work on this paper obviously has been uh, stopped because of the invasion in Ukraine. So here, the idea was that we wanted to see all the closures by Nabuyinas, under Nabuyinas' uh, tenure of the banks, so there was like two-thirds of all uh, operating banks in, in Russia were shut at, and so we do empirical exercises to, ass, uh, to assess the impact on the firms. And what we see is actually borrower performance is increasing. So this, this shuttering of all these banks was actually benefit, benefiting the quality of the firms, or was beneficial for the upgrading of the quality of the firms that were dealing with these banks. And we can actually see this for individual firms that really before were really lackluster performing and then started to perform. Of course, some firms were um, so fraudulent that no, no uh, salvation was possible, so to speak. Now, we were in the midst of discussing with the Central Bank of Russia, with the two quarters, whether or not we could also use this uh, exercise, this setup, for actually seeing whether or not there was purposely hardening of the banking sector to sanctions, okay? But then, of course, the invasion occurred, and I think we all agreed that we should call it a day for the time being. Um, so then, um, this is one uh, piece of information I want to add to the discussion, and the other one was basically another paper where we show that energy and Kremlin-connected oligarch firms were unaffected by two decades of sanctions. Uh, and we also have exercise, but they're small exercise, so I don't want to hang my hat on this too much, but they are at least consistent with the interpretation that Russian firms were prepared for the Crimea event and the Ukraine war. You can see shifts in their balance sheets to, to seemingly make them a bit more resistant. Again, uh, and the paper citation is there. Very good. Um, I, I think I'm pretty much out of time. I was told to end before time. I have a small ec epilogue, which is a bit regressive, I admit it, I'm the first to admit it. So if I think about banks, I always think about banks as being barba papas, okay? So impose sanctions on them, and they'll show you how agile they are in avoidance, anticipation, and in flight. Now, we want to internalize this as policymakers, not that I'm one myself, but as policymaking, one needs to internalize this not for having financial sanctions, uh, to become a circus. Okay, thank you.